I just had a great interview with a good friend of mine called Sidney Mohid. Sid is the worship pastor, creative director for the mighty JPCC Church in Jakarta, Indonesia. I love that church. Pastor Jeffrey Rashmat is one of my favorite people in the world, as is Sid. And we spoke about Sid's journey uh, to date in his life and dug into some of the aspects of that fascinating uh, his creative process, uh, Sid is a prolific singer, songwriter, music producer uh, for the church albums that he does and his own projects. Uh, he's an interesting guy. We dug into um, some of his interests outside the church, some of the hobbies that he have that keep him flourishing uh, and grounded as a person, his love of comics and video games. Uh, we spoke about some of the challenges we both feel the church face in reaching the emerging generation and some of the challenges of the emerging generation too with regard to faith and spirituality and so on. Uh, I think you're going to love this interview. I hope you do. I'd love you to subscribe to my podcast channel. I hope you enjoy. Thank you. Before you get started on today's podcast with Paul Scanlon, we just wanted to let you know that he now has a free course available to you. If you head over to paulscanlon.com forward slash free course, you'll be able to sign up to his video series called The Five Behaviors of Successful People. We hope that this course adds value to your life. Now enjoy the podcast. Pluses and minuses, Sid, of the lockdown. What have you felt about it in terms of things you've missed, things you haven't missed and so on? Has it been predictable for you how it's affected you or not? I'm naturally uh, an introvert as you probably know. So this, yeah, me too. Have, yeah. Yeah, this have been a blessing in disguise for me. I mean, as, as someone who uh, just love being by himself and has no problem being by himself uh, right. in what I do, I think this is, this is all right. You know, but there are some things that I miss, you know, just getting coffee in my, my, my favorite coffee shops or things like that. But other than that, uh, things have just shifted geographically. I mean, from the studio in my office to studio here. And this, this, this is actually my children's study room that I just kind of converted temporarily okay. as as my as my little studio. So yeah, I mean, uh, but one thing that that <clears throat> pandemic have shown us, and and even in our family, I, I was talking about this that it really filters out all the non-essential things in life. Right. Uh, that it just kind of focuses on what's the priority. That at the end of right. the day, what this lockdown and quarantine season have taught us is that there, there's so many fillers in our lives, you know, to keep us occupied, to keep us interested about life when actually they're not that important. They're not that essential. You can have everything you have here already at home. And uh, it's been shown yet. Yeah. Do you think people wired like you and I said the art more uh, introvert? Um, obviously, all the fillers, we never relied on them anyway to be happy and to, uh, to function well and to be fruitful in what we do. But people mm -hmm. that are wired more for uh, to be extrovert or are more like social animals, party <laughs> people and so on and so on. And, and, recharge through social settings and we don't mm. how are they finding all this you think <clears throat> my wife is the exact opposite of me I mean, there you go okay loves she loves going out she loves being with friends so that's one of the things that early on she was very stressed out about was actually when can i go and hang out with my friends right. you know, sure. just with the girls you know, doing things in the mall and things like that. And you've you've been to Jakarta, where yeah. the mall is everything. Right. So yeah, for for them, this is a big deal. I mean, this this. Uh, and she was always kind of like upset. It's like, how come you're not stressed out? <laughs> you know, how come you're not you're not upset in this season? I'm like, I'm I'm actually happy. This is something that I've prayed for for a long time. You know, God, can wow. I just be home a bit more? You know, instead of traveling just like you are, and mm -hmm. um. So yeah, it's, I, I think it depends on the spectrum of the things that kind of lifts you up. And for my wife is being with friends and uh, hanging out. Uh, so for them, it, it, it is a big deal. Freedom's a strange thing, isn't it? Because the things I miss are the things I don't miss. It's, so it comes down to 
it's not having the option, I suppose, that is the frustrating thing. I don't have the option to travel or to go anywhere. And yet I'm loving not going anywhere. Right. And I think that must be part of the complexity for people that finish up in jail or people that lose their freedom at some point in life right. after they've had options. I think it's that psychologically is the torment of long-term incarceration in any form. Don't you think it's just, it's not that if you, it's like you don't know what you had till you've not got it, you know, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I absolutely agree. It's just the, the fact that we don't have that option. Yeah. Go yeah. anywhere. That's I think that's the frustration even for introvert people like us. You know right. that that there's not that much. I mean, the, right. But you have um, you know the things that interest you. Wh whether it's for me, it's always music. For me, it's always the studio. Has always been uh, an interesting part of my life where I I get that's that's where my gasoline comes you know it, it lifts me up it sparks me up so i have that option and and for me i'm just gonna jump into this and uh and be okay with it what is it about what you do said you know in light of what you just said what is it about what you do that you do feel feels you and lights you up because that seems to me that you are alluding to the enjoyment of the process of what you do rather than the outcome of what you do in other that's, words, you you write a song and perform the song, but almost that's less important than your passion for the process that leads towards that. Would that be fair to say about your creative flow? Very, very. Uh, and I've learned this. I mean, again, uh, I've been doing this now 30 years. I'm, I'm 47 this year, so I started this journey of music and, and praise and worship, you know, at the age of 17, 30 oh. years. Ago. So I've been doing this for a long time. I've I produced I countless albums. So, and I realized along the way, and I think halfway through it, that I actually enjoy the process of making an album mm. much more than actually having the product in my hand or even going on, on tour. Maybe mm. that's the introvert side of me speaking that, that I, I kind of dread, you know, having to fly, bringing all the gears and, and, quote unquote, performing in front of people, because I like this process even more, just being in, you know, in front of my keyboard or guitar and writing. And, and, and I think what it is, is just a discovery kind of thing, you know, as creatives, that's what we always long for. And that's what we always strive for to understand ourselves with, with each song that we create with each dance that we choreograph or, or writings that we we understand more about ourselves. And I think that's why it always interests me with every piece of music, with every song that I've written in the past 30 years. I've gained more understanding about myself and the God who created me. And, and, and I think that's the joy of it, you know. I think the loving of the process has made me more aware of the need to say to the emerging generation who are mm -hmm. wondering how they find their how they find their sweet spot their passion their gift their calling and usually that's often been answered with regard to them paying attention to who's getting great results in some area and they want to have that for their own lives so they tend to pursue outcomes and results rather than start with what do you love to do what, right. what process do you love? How are you wired as a person? And no one ever told me that as a younger person, sure. that, do you, that my love of study, my love of books, my love of learning, like you talked about for you, no one said to me that that counted for anything because that, that couldn't possibly pay the bills or be enough to live from, that that would always only ever be a hobby. So for years, I felt I was separated from the essential nature of the process, I was kept away from it by doing my job and raising my family. And almost this process that I was drawn to magnetically was seen as an interference. Right. Well, especially, you know, I, I, Asians, Asian family, especially where the things that we do is uh, when it comes to art, when it comes to dance or performing arts, whether it's music or uh, uh, painting, drawing, and things like that are, are 
kind of frowned upon in the Asian culture because, you know, you're not, you're not, what are you going to do with the rest of your lives doing that art? You know, it's, it's always towards, you got to be a businessman. You, you got to be a, a, an entrepreneur or any, something like that, 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 that produces money and income. And I think that's the generation uh, that, that before us that, that taught us that, that at the end of the day, it's, it's always about, can it feed your family? Can it, can it be, are you going to be financially stable doing what you do? And I think that's why the soul is being overlooked. You know, as long as you do things with your mind being, you know, that's why we are always so bombarded with uh, uh, having, having that success in school, in college, because, you know, as long as your mind is smart, as, as long as you're the smartest in the family, it doesn't really mm. matter what your soul needs and lack. And, mm. uh, but it's hurting a lot of people, uh, hurting a lot of people in my age, in my age group that, uh, you know, by now they're in their 40s or, you know, early 50s. And, and they're like, I wish I could have pursued my passion when I was at an early age instead of doing what my family uh, told me to do. And, and I see a lot of that. When I first came to Jakarta years ago, I came straight after I'd been in Singapore. And I think I spoke to you or certainly to the group of your business people I was with, contrasting Singapore to Jakarta, just as a first time comparison. Mm. And, and, and the sense of uniformity and compliance, as you know, in the Singaporean culture. Um, and when I first landed at Jakarta airport, it felt like a coup was taking place. It was, it was loud, it was chaotic, there seemed to be no organization uh, compared, to the, con compared to the clinical nature of the behavior in Singapore. And yeah. then, when, then when your driver from JPCC picked us up and drove us into town to the hotel, um, suddenly all the three, four lane freeway came down to one or two and everything just gridlocked. And I said to the driver, you know, is there a problem? Is there a road accident? And uh, he said, no, uh, you'll see what the problem is in a moment. And what happened was, as we got further down the, the freeway, um, it had started to rain and everybody on motorcycles had stopped under bridges. Yeah. And it yeah. gridlocked the whole city. And there were even cops on the motorcycles under the bridges. But in yeah. Singapore, as you know, they'd all be in jail. And nobody cared in in Indonesia. And I asked one of your entrepreneurs about this. And he said to me, I think the difference between here and Singapore is that in business, we would not choose a Singaporean for anything beyond middle management because of their tendency to be compliant and want to be told what to do. We're looking for people with initiative. And he felt that the culture of Indonesia had fostered in them from childhood this sense of self-sufficiency because you don't know whether tomorrow you'll be alive because of the numerous uh, fires or floods or earthquakes, as well as terrorism and so on and so on. He spoke about in more recent years. Yeah. So this sense of self-sufficiency and the government doesn't provide for your uh, families in the same way Singaporean government does in terms of welfare system. I say all that to say, do you think that has handed you the entrepreneurial flair that I know you also have, Sid? Absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, I, I guess for me, there's there's a bit of a difference. I, I grew up in the States. I, I ever since I okay, was a little right. boy, moved to America. So I, I do have that Western mindset that kind of helped me along the way as well of, you know, being able to, to speak my own thoughts, you know, where, especially in Indonesia, that's not something that's being encouraged. So, yes. but yeah, I really do believe that it's, there's a big difference. Uh, Singaporean were British colonies. Right. So, so I think the, the way the British have raised up the generation yes. during the time was yep. very different than Indonesia, which was colonized by the Dutch, you know, and uh, right. the Dutch were not very keen on educating the, the indigenous people of, of our nation. So for mm. the longest time, we were not as smart or intellectual as some of the, the, the British colonies, you know. So I think that's our advantage, you know, that we were always 
looked at as as the underdogs in the Southeast Asian countries uh, right. back from the 50s, 60s, 70s. But because of that, which uh, it just kind of pushed our people to literally say, we got nothing to lose. Like we absolutely have nothing right. to lose. Right. Uh, if no one's going to care for us or think about the future of our family or, or our livelihood, we're just going to have to fight our own way. And I really do see a lot of that in the Indonesian, especially in the businessman and creative mm. side of things, where mm. the people, most of the the uh, amazing creative people that I learn and, 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 and get to know, they're mostly self-taught. They're mostly self-taught. They never go overseas to study. They, they uh, you know, everything they know is self-taught. Mm. And, and I love that about our people. Uh, it's just that grit. It's that perseverance of, again, I got nothing to lose. I just, I'm doing this for my own and I'm doing this for the future. So, yeah. How old were you when you went to uh, Jakarta from America? I was 22. This was back in 1995. So moved to America back in the early 80s. I was I was still in uh, uh, elementary school, as the Americans would say it, and uh, moved back to Indonesia when I was 22. So wow. I was at that right age of yeah uh, of being obnoxious and think that he could he could uh, I could change the world with what I know from America. But at the same time, I, I was I was young enough to learn that I don't know everything. So I've always felt I've always felt about you, Sid, that you have a unusual sense of confidence. And I don't mean confidence in what you do or stage confidence, mm. but I mean as a person. And now I'm hearing about your beginnings in America, which of course is a very confident sort of culture there. Do you feel that that's been part of the confidence that you now have in your midlife because of your beginnings in America? Well, when, when we moved to America, it was just my mom and, and two sisters and me. So the four of us moved because of the divorce. So uh, my parents divorced in the early 80s, which Southeast Asia, I mean, especially Indonesia, uh, it was unheard of. Divorce, right. I remember I was in third grade or fourth grade. And uh, in my whole entire school, uh, I was the only boy with divorced parents. Mm. And that was one of the reasons, I think, if not the main reasons why my mom, our mom decided to, to move to America and wow. just start over and start from the beginning. And, and it wasn't like, it was pretty much like an immigrant story where, where literally we had nothing and we had to work from the ground up. Um, but I think it does, I mean, Growing up there as a, as a teenager, learning the do's and don'ts, uh, trying to be street smart because you know we we were raised not in a very good neighborhood, mm -hmm. and uh, it it did gave me that confidence of and, and being the only man in the family at that time, right? Uh, so I had to work from a very early age, uh, earn my own money, uh, supported my own self, uh, paid my own college. Wow. back during the day so so it gave me that sense of all right i can do this i can do this life thing and mm -hmm. then uh, when god told me to to go to indonesia at the age of 22 you know being naively thinking that i'm i'm here to save indonesia i'm here to change praise and worship and all that kind of stuff and then later on i found out that that wasn't the case when you say god told you what do you mean by that how do you know God told you something? How, how do you how do you locate that in your life and journey? What when you use that phrase about things in yeah. your life and you yeah. don't use it about other things in your life? What's the difference? Yeah, I, I knew when I said that I was like, ah, oh, okay, I shouldn't have said that. Uh, no, no, I, you should have said that. I'm just, I'm just, I'm picking you up on it because I think in the church world we use that phrase a lot and no one ever asks anybody what do you mean, and I think yeah. our listeners that are not just church people, our listeners would be helped by me and you breaking that down a wee bit as to what do you mean by that? Because I think it's incumbent on us when we use that phrase to be able to say what that means as if we're explaining it to a stranger. Right. <laughs> so the way I would explain it to people who, who don't go to church and don't know the lingo, which mm. that's why I shouldn't have said that because that's a very no, no, Christianese lingo. God spoke that's to me. That's good. I'm glad it came up. It's good. Uh, 
I, if I'm honest, in the in the 47 years of my life, I've never yeah. heard an audible voice of God. Sure. I've never heard that God would say or wake me up in the middle of the night, Sydney, you know, with that echo and mm. delay. I, I never have that. But as I said, I've I've been very good in terms of listening instinctively mm. to whatever that sound is, whether mm. you know, in the spirituality, whether it's 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 you know that inner voice. But I really do believe that it's different. Mm. So what it what happened was I had several people that I really respected in my life uh, spoke to me and said that hey you know I was I was praying and 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 this is the word that I got for you mm. and and I remember this was back in 1995 end of 1994 I had people that I really respected some of my mentors would come up to me and said I don't know why but God said Indonesia and I'm like and and you have to understand that growing up in America I thought I was going to I, I was going to stay in America for the rest of my life. You know, sure. I was, I was, I was already in that mindset and season of my life. So when, when that man told me that, uh, God wants you to go to Indonesia or think about Indonesia, I'm like, no, get away from me. This must not be from the Lord, you know, because mm. I really mm. believe that I'm going to stay in America for the rest of my life. Mm. But then the second person came up to me and pretty much said the same thing a month afterwards. And then a, a third guy that I really respected said the same thing. And, and, and I began to like, okay, uh, the earth and the moon and the stars are lining up to tell me something. Here. Right, right. There's this serendipity or whatever you want to call it. There's just this mm -hmm. something that's happening. It's just kind of telling me to do something. Mm -hmm. And, and I've been very instinctive in my life that Whatever that is, I have to listen to it. Mm. You know, either I have to research it, either I have to kind of surrender to it or whatever it is. Uh, and that's exactly what I did. So I, I, I basically told my family and my, my friends, I said, I'm kind of, I, I think I want to go to Indonesia and just kind of check it out. What this voice is telling me to do. Uh, kind of like those Disney movies where they always say, if you don't know what to do, just take the next step, you know, of the mm -hmm. next best thing or the right thing that you need to do. Right. So my decision was I bought a, I bought a, a one way ticket to Indonesia. Now you have to understand, I haven't seen Indonesia since I was a little boy mm -hmm. and I had no friends, no, no family. I had to literally search my, for my dad again, when I, get into Indonesia because we lost contact for those many years. Oh. And, um, but I, I followed and I listened and I obeyed. And uh, I just told my family that give me a year. Uh, I think I'm, I want to give it a try. I was 22. Again, I had nothing to lose. You know, mm -hmm. if, if it didn't work, if I didn't sure. find what I was looking for, I could always go back. I was, you know, I was handing the car keys to, to my sister in America. I said, keep it. You know, all my stuff, my comic book collection. Can you keep it? Save it for me until I get back. And uh, I went to Indonesia on that journey just to, just to see what that mm. voice was telling me. And May 1st, 1995. So this is like my 20, this month is my 25th uh, anniversary of stepping into Jakarta for the first time since I was a little boy. Yeah, I was interested in what aligned for you once you physically got to Jakarta said, because I think, did someone say to you, go and check it out? Or did you decide to do that for yourself? I mean, rather than buy a one way ticket and decide this has got to be God, I can't go back. What was your frame of mind in going? I'll check it out. Yeah, it was, it was more me okay. being 22. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, I think if, it, if I was 37, I don't think I would have done it. But since yeah, I was, there you go. Uh, it was, it was the age played a big factor of it, of, I, you know, I got nothing to lose, uh, that if, if it didn't work out, I could always go back to my comfortable life of mm. going to Target and Costco and, and being in America. But right. yeah, it was, it was more of that, um, because I hear people, I mean, these were not just strangers, but people that I really 
respected and 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 admired and that that spoke into my life so mm. i said um yeah i kind of want to just check it out and, and it didn't work out like in the beginning i mean you know i i enrolled myself in a in a bible school in jakarta indonesia it was a very tiny bible school in indonesia and and, and but right from the beginning god just kind of a uh, 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 place me to meet different people in my life which mm. are now the people that that uh, I am with in in building our church in JP yes wow so it was just one of those things that that uh over time I remember the first year came and went and I decided you know what I'm, I'm okay uh, I mean financially mm. horrible I remember I only mm. had like thousand dollars in my pocket for like a whole year right you know uh but i think and and this is what i always teach people how do you know it's from the lord number one i had peace it wasn't mm -hmm. something that i was forced it wasn't something that i was like oh god i'm so miserable but, mm -hmm. but let's do this but it was more like i absolutely genuinely had peace that yeah. oh this is all right even the floods were taking all my possessions you know money wise it was kind of terrible uh, it wasn't kind of, it was very terrible during that time. But I had that peace beyond understanding that I just simply couldn't explain to people mm. that I just knew that this is, this is, this is it. This is what I'm supposed, this is where I'm supposed to be. Mm. And, and again, I think it's because I'm very instinctive in the way I do things creatively or, or the way I run my life. So I decided just to stick with it. And, uh, and when I met, all these people from from Jeffrey and and you know my bandmates and all these people it, just, it was as if the stars were lining up you know and if, if like for a better expression I think that's a good response because I think in all the things that people say are essential to the guidance process I think that sense of peace that is that is consistent that doesn't budge is the most reliable way I think of you know, making decisions at crossroads. And I think because people uh, cannot understand an individual's sense of intuitive peace, they often feel you made a wrong move and try to right. convince you it was wrong, but your overwhelming sense of consistent peace ultimately becomes your go-to place for, as you said, knowing it's kind of God or not God for my life. I think of all the things that the enemy can counterfeit, he can counterfeit that peace that you have. He can fool right. you by a lot of dodgy external stuff, but that in, inner peace, I think, is absolutely right. You mentioned Sid a moment ago, and I, I, just while it's come up and you mentioned it, I wrote it down, about your comics. <laughs> yeah. Tell us about that, because people, I think, will be surprised to know about your passion and interest in comics since early in your life, right? Well, what people don't know about me was that I was I was actually I went to school uh, pursuing art, not music. Uh, I was I had a I received a scholarship back in high school for my art for illustration and painting uh, mm. from Walt Disney Company, and I was one of the twelve students that was chosen in Los Angeles County uh, to receive the scholarship. So all throughout, all throughout my teenage years, all the way until uh, I left for Indonesia, I was I was heavily invested in my visual arts, which which was mm. painting, comics, and and illustration. It was one of my one of my dreams was actually to become a comic artist, comic pencil. Wow. Uh, mm. and that's just something that that I've loved even before I moved to America, since I was a little boy. I remember reading Spider-Man comics or Thor or X-Men when I was a kid, and it just stayed with me until now. I'm I'm 47 and still love it, you know. Wow. But yeah, it's, it's because of those uh, backgrounds of being in the in the illustration and visual arts. I love that. I yeah. love that. How do you how do you sum up what you do now, Sid? How do you describe what you do if you're talking to a stranger on a plane? Because I find this quite yeah. a challenge where people say, "What do you do?" I've found yeah. a short way to answer it. And when I answer it in a short way, I leave it then as to whether or not they want to take it further. In this right. country, my go-to response when I didn't want to get in conversation about what I did 
was to tell them I work in the church, which is a killer for conversation across Europe, as you know. In America, if you mention you work in the church, they feel like you're a public servant, start telling you their problems. But, <laughs> but for you, what you do is quite layered now. So how do you answer what you do? So I, when people ask me, especially now in the season of my life where I, 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 I'm more uh, creating and producing and writing, I just tell them that I make, I make songs for churches of our nation uh, and hopefully for the region of Asia as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that would be the easiest way to, to tell people I make sounds and melodies and, and, uh, and songs for churches to sing. Um, but yeah, I think, it, but, but if they, if, if that's not what they're interested in, usually I would just say I'm a producer, I'm a, I'm a music producer and, uh, and a songwriter, which is kind of like the easiest way to say it. And your approach to your creative process, Sid, because I know you also have an entrepreneurial side to you and have businesses that you're interested in and so on yeah. throughout the years. Um, is your creative process, like how do you start creatively? Are you always on in your head a bit like me in terms of scouting for ideas or things that inspire you that you write, write down and then you go and dig into it deeper? Especially in the lockdown, I guess that creative process has been able to shrink down a bit condensed every day right. now because you're doing nothing else. Right, right. Uh, uh, for me, as I said, uh, the way I run my life is been very intuitive, instinctive. So I was not uh, taught the basics and the fundamental of music. Everything I know about music and producing mm. and writing is pretty much self-taught and self-research. Right. So, so um, I am, like I said, I love research. I, I because music is my passion. I'm always I'm always searching for new songs, for new sounds. Um, so my go-to's, especially nowadays, is always YouTube. I'm I'm constantly on YouTube, just scouring different different things that you know what other people are doing around the world. Yeah, uh, not just the mainstream music. A lot of the things that that uh, songs that I play to people, they 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 always ask me this question: How do you how do you get to know these music? I mean, where did you find these? You know, because uh, they call me like the king of unheard of music because I always have this playlist of indie bands or indie singers, singer songwriters that nobody have heard of, but I, I found them and, and they're absolutely fantastic. So that's the kind of person I am uh, in terms of what inspires me and what, what sparks my interest in music. And, um, and another thing is I just, I just keep learning. Mm -hmm. I, I'm on YouTube most of the time is for the tutorials. I learn a lot about sounds and, and, and designing sounds and mixing and things like that. And, and at the age of 47, I still learn something new every single day. So I think I read a book years ago called Steal Like an Artist. Um, and the idea being that we should all be stealing from each other. And going back through, through history, especially studying the masters, Picasso and Renoir and so on, Picasso famously spoke about he stole from everybody Oh yeah, and the diff the difference between stealing and copying being the copying is kind of just karaoke version of what it is that you picked up, but stealing is that you you are inspired by others and then you put your own unique take on it. Absolutely. So you are you are influenced rather than you are imitating, and I think what you just said there, Sid, of your influence from the indie world and so on. I was going to ask you too, what are some of your sort of go-to bands in your playlists that you love listening to regularly? What are, any particular bands that you're drawn to? Sounds? <clears throat> I'm, I've always, I mean, for me, U2 have always been the kind of... Yeah, I love U2. And that, uh, you know, I checked off my bucket list that uh, my, wife, my wife surprised me with uh, two U2 tickets to see them in, in Singapore last year. Uh -huh. Uh, uh, I've I've always thought I would never see them because I've heard that they refuse to play in Indonesia for so many years now. And, uh, okay. Yeah, and uh, because of the human rights issues and things like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, and then and then my wife says, "Well, you know, we're gonna go see you too." And I was like, literally in tears last year during that concert, wow. just watching it. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, if you ask me if there's a band, because I remember as early as year four in my elementary school, I had this little notebook that had U2 uh, as as the cover. It was one of those cheap uh. notebooks. And it was U2, and I've, I've passionately have listened to them since I was, I guess, what, seven? That must be like 40, 39 years ago. So it's, it's yeah, melodically, uh, philosophically, uh, lyrically, I think Bono is a genius. So, um, and I always ask people, uh, you know, especially if, if they come from Europe, any one of you knows Bono, because if somebody can connect me to the right direction to speak with Bono, that would be, that would be a, a tick on my bucket list. Oh, um, that's amazing. Yeah, very cool. Let me ask you a couple of things, Said I don't take much more of your time. Regarding church, any, any observations, concerns, um, hopes for the emerging generation of the church? Do you feel that there are particular challenges they are facing and are going to face that perhaps my generation or even yours didn't um, in, in good or in challenging ways in terms of what you do, what you see in the emerging generation, how they're wired, how they yeah. think? Yeah. I was a part of, uh, there was this, uh, in a, an American institution called the Barna Group. I yes, the Barna Group, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, they were doing research about, you know, of course, as what we're talking about, the generations. Mm. And they came to Jakarta in January, I think either January or uh, early February, and uh, had a talk with them. And during our conversation, they said something that just kind of stuck with me until today. And uh, they said that from their research, from their interviews uh, and polls, they've, they've found that back in the day, in the past, uh, the older generation believed that truth is objective, but good is subjective. That's in the past. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. the emerging generation believe it's actually the opposite now, that truth can be subjective, but the moral good is always absolute. What what they're saying is that they found this generation believe more in the kindness of people, more in that the truth that mm. all these pastors or churches kept on saying. So mm. from what I gathered from that conversation was that I think this is the generation where the church should live out what they preach and speak and sing, mm. especially as as a songwriter. Uh, uh, every time, you know, the, the younger generation come up to me and said, I'm, I'm making an album. Do you have any, do you have any tips or tricks or what's, what's your big advice for me? And I always tell them, you have to live what you sing. You have to live mm -hmm. what you sing, or you have to live what you write. And I think this is the challenge for today's, um, right. churches that the age of you know, the holier than thou kind of generation where we look and act the part, but don't live the part is no longer, mm -hmm. you know, that we look like a pastor, we talk like a pastor, we preach like a pastor, but we don't mm -hmm. live like one. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that was an eye opening thing for me and, and something that is instinctively I've been doing in the last 30 years in my ministry mm -hmm. that I, I couldn't care less about but what, what people think about me as, mm. you know, or, or my titles or, or whether people consider me as a, as a pastor or not, those things are so irrelevant for me, but I'm more about how is my life doing is what I'm saying and what I'm singing reflecting my life. Mm. And, uh, yeah, I think that's the biggest challenge because for the older generation, especially now, and we're seeing it now in this during this whole lockdown and pandemic where everyone has to go online. Everyone has to right. go online. In the past right. two months, I've seen churches struggling, you know, to, to appear right. uh, uh, as a pastor speaking to a camera, speaking to people, and they don't right. have that luxury of being in that church anymore. And, right. and the, thing, the thing with our generation is they can see authenticity from a mile off, right. you know, whether, whether you are actually living, uh, what you're saying, what you're preaching. And, and I think that's a, such a big challenge, uh, 
from the last generation to the next generation. I felt for a long time that the Western church is buildings and campus centric. And so when we don't have buildings and campuses anymore, we don't quite know what to do because our definition of words like attendance and community and engagement and involvement and volunteering are all attached to a campus and a building and a property somewhere rather than to a community, rather than to a community. And so I do wonder whether or not when this is all over, one of the opportunities that we have in the West is to redefine and repurpose our properties and our campuses more towards community rather than towards Sundays. Right. Um, because I do think a lot of people who have never ever thought they could possibly engage through online have discovered they can and they prefer it. Right. And that, that genie may never go back in the lamp in terms of people going back to an attachment to a property and to a Sunday service. And I wonder whether or not that's been thought ahead by people who are just thinking, because when we get back to normal, I'm not sure that we're going to get back to that version of normal. Don't you think? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Absolutely. And I've been, I've been telling people this, that what we considered as normal is no more. This is, right. this, this is a, an emerging normal. This is a very different kind of normal, especially uh, for a, an institution like the church. What we've done in our church for the past 20 years have, uh, because our leadership is all, always not about the Sunday service, which I think right. was done right and correctly right from the beginning. Yes. That yeah. we were not interested in just making a church on Sundays, but we're, we're interested in building a generation. That was our mission statement right from the beginning was that to build a generation of, uh, of stars with the message of truth. That was right from the beginning of our church, JPCC. Yes. So yes. It was the, 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 the goal was always building people. It was never about building a, a, a service. Absolutely. When we started 20 years ago, back in 1999, there was only 50 of us, 60 of us, and it has grown yes. to tremendous numbers in the past 20 years. Yes. But what we've done successfully was that we built our church based on community. We mm -hmm. have, I think, one of the largest, if not the largest, in terms of small groups in churches uh, mm -hmm. uh, in, in our nation. Um, and, and because we've had several seasons in our church where back in 2001 we had a, a, a bombing uh this was when our church was about i think about five thousand or six thousand people yeah. we had a bombing uh, uh of the australian embassy right next to our campus right next to our uh venue and and it forced us to really rely on small groups because yeah. there was a chance there was a, a possibility during that time that we couldn't meet on sundays right and yet during that time, our community, our, our, our small groups were so strong that right. we realized that we, we would be okay. Even if we don't meet on Sundays, we'd still be okay. Very now, cool. fast forward mm -hmm. to 2020, when mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the government says, okay, no more large gatherings. We're like, cool, let's just switch it and uh, go straight online because we've been doing it in the past two years anyway. And uh, I remember we started our online service, putting it on YouTube because of a fire. There was a fire that happened in one of our campus in, in Upper Room. And right. uh, it forced, Memory. yeah, you remember that. And, and it forced yeah. our Sunday service on that campus to close down for, I think, for a good four or five months. Wow. And we decided, okay, well, you know what? Why don't we just start the online service and see if it works? So we've, we've started that two years ago. So when it comes time to, to isolation and quarantine, we're like, okay, cool. Just switch it back on and, uh, and let's just go with that. And now yeah. every week I have, I have people in, in our small groups that were sending pictures that they would do, they would go to, they would watch their online service in, in the Zoom, like just like here, they would share right. the screen and with, with all their small group members uh, in the Zoom, watching it together, sharing notes. And I thought, that's it. You know, like we, we have nothing to worry about as a church wow. because the community is still there, you know, even if we don't meet on Sundays. Right, so. very cool. I think I've always loved that amongst the many things I love about your church. I think that sense of growing people rather than things would be my way of saying it, where I teach around the world. 
I think you guys have captured that so well ever since I've come to you guys, that sense of investing in people and that sense of having this fluid relationship with a building and a campus. I didn't, I wasn't aware of the history that's contributed to that, but it makes so much sense now, which to me gives the Eastern church the edge over um, the Western church that is very attached to buildings at this time, the way that you've quickly diversified into online, no big deal. Um, is not what I'm finding in the West. Many pastors in the West are panicking that they're trying to pay for these buildings um, and they're hoping people will come back to these buildings. What do we do with these buildings? And everything becomes about sustaining a property and paying for a mortgage and paying for a campus. Wondering now whether or not there's ever going to be a way to continue to finance that if the people don't come back in the way that they were there in the first place. And I think there's a lot of game-changing, serendipitous things going to happen that I'm framing as a positive thing. I'm sure many are not framing it as that. Um, Sid, let me ask you, uh, just finally, a couple of things. Um, hobbies, sure. interests. I know the comic, I know the comics and things, but what, are your, what lights you up as a person? Because you were very, whenever I've been with you, you strike me as a very happy person. You're very conversational. You're very interested in other people. And you've consistently kept that, which I think in ministry, in what we have done in ministry, and I pastored for 30 years, I think keeping that happy, outgoing, interesting persona is not easy. So you must have been intentional about it with other things other than church yeah. roles. Right. So I, uh, people always ask me this, that, that how, how, how do you not burn out even yeah. after all these years and, 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 and still have this positive energy and outlook yeah. in life? So I remember, I think in the early years of JPCC, I was hosting a, a pastor just like you, because I always host you whenever mm. you're around. Sure, um, yes. And I remember I was I was in the car with him, and he was an older gentleman. Uh, he was already in the ministry for a long time, and I asked him, "Hey, what's what's your? If there's any advice, how would you tell somebody who is young in the ministry like me?" to to be to have that longevity uh in in terms of ministry and i remember he said something that it's it stuck with me uh throughout the years which kind of made me who i am today he said mm. get a hobby that is so different than your ministry and keep it mm. right and and you know i was i was waiting for a verse i was waiting for, for right. you know like, pray for five hours a day yeah you know, read the Bible six times a year, of you course. know, but, but he said, get a hobby that is so different than ministry because he was asking me, he's like, so what do you do? I'm in the music ministry. So I find something that interests you that has nothing to do with music. Right. And I was like, but that's counterproductive of what I've always <laughs> thought about, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and then he asked me, so what do you, what is it that you want to do that you haven't been able to do because of quote unquote your ministry? And I said, I think playing games. I, I love playing video games, but for some reason, I always have this guilty feeling that if I play video games, right, I'm right. not uh, uh, <laughs> being a man of the ministry. You know what I yes, mean? Sure. And he said, no, 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 no. Keep doing that. Go find a game that you love and just play whenever you have time. Uh, oh. it, even if you don't have time, find the time to play your games, your mm-hmm. video games. And, and I remember that just changed, you know, everything that I thought about, about ministry. That's cool. Yeah. And, and from that moment on, I'm, I'm like, literally, you, you, I have from Xbox, PS, all the Playstations. Now I'm, I'm playing my Nintendo Switch. I play my games whenever possible um, because it lights me up. I mean, and, and it has nothing to do with church, nothing to do with praise and worship nothing to do with all these christian songs i just want to play star wars or i just want to play some japanese rpg and i'm happy and this is something that i've always taught our team you know that that i think uh find something that that you know it it lights you up whatever that is it could be cooking it could be it could be playing bowling whatever it is yeah. That is so different than what you do as ministry. Because I think for, for the longest time, we've always been taught, you know, oh, you know, if you want to be in the ministry, you got you to gotta submerge yourself into right. whatever it is that you do and, and forget everything. Uh, you know, I remember 
posting me playing a, a video game one time on Instagram many years ago. And somebody literally put a comment and it's like, wow, can pastors play video games? Wow. Like, because that's the, the mindset that a lot of us are, are, uh, are being taught. So if you ask me, those, those are some of the that's things. very cool. Watching movies. Think, yeah, I love that too. I think one of the reasons I didn't find it difficult to step away from pastoring after 30 years was that I knew my identity was not attached to it. Right. Um, and I think a lot of people in ministry struggle to transition to some other expression of life. Right. Um, because they're over identified with a role and a job and a title rather than uh, being, a, being attached to their fundamental skill and calling, yeah. which could serve in multiple ways. Yeah. And I think what you just described of having this, of seeing what you do as what you do, but your identity isn't completely tied up with that because you are good at a range of things um, that you could transfer, which you have into other expressions of creativity. Absolutely. Um, what are you working on at the moment, Sid? What are you working on now? Future projects coming up and so on. Well, project is always on uh, because I'm, I'm the creative pastor of our church, JPCC, and uh, I oversee the JPCC worship and all the productions of it. So sure. we're, we're writing songs. We're, we're still coming up. I'm, I'm in the middle of producing the children's EP and also the youth EP that's coming cool. out. So, but at the moment, I think the way we do music is different as well. The way we listen to music is different than, than what we always used to. Back in the day, we, we had to listen to albums. We have to go to a, a music store, buy the CD or the cassette right. if you're old right. enough, and uh, go home and start listening to it. But nowadays, it's everything is on our phone, and we don't usually listen to full albums anymore. Right. You know, we just pick and choose and make our own playlist. That's <clears throat> the emerging generation. We make what we love. We make our own playlist. And your yes. playlist is different than my playlist. Yes. And, and so the way we produce things are different as well. Um, nowadays, I'm, I'm not really concerned about strategic marketing and the timing of when to release. If we have a song, release it straight away in Spotify. Okay, so, interesting. Uh, we just wrote something about a couple of weeks back, produced it, and I think by next week, it's already going to be out on the on Spotify. So, wow. yeah. yeah, everything is changing. Everything is changing, so... Nowadays, it's uh, if it's timely, release it. And uh, even if it's just a single, we don't have to wait like for a full album. So, yeah. So we do have a yeah, lot I, on our plate right now. I like that. That's very true. Um, Sid, how can uh, our listeners find you and track with what you do? Well, um, I'm pretty much active on the Instagram. It's under at Sid Mohiri. Uh, on my Instagram and also on YouTube. I have a YouTube channel, uh, but I do have a Twitter, uh, Facebook and all that, but usually it's just kind of uh, tangent with my with my uh, uh, Instagram. Yeah. You have a massive social media following. Um, do, you do you enjoy that? Do you like that? What, how much of your day does that take up, the social media? <laughs> Frankly, I really couldn't care less about my social media. That's the funny right. thing about me. I think I, I'm not. Uh, I remember my son came up to me one time. This was many years ago. He said, "Dad, did you know that you have one million followers on Twitter?" And I'm like, <laughs> "Really? I had no clue. Like, I had a million people on my Twitter. And I'm like, one That's million. Hilarious. And then yeah. when I saw it, I was like, and then he's like, "That is the best thing, Dad." And, then, and I remember I told him. That, Hey, you know what? Delete this right now, and I and I wouldn't regret it. Is yeah. why, Dad? Because for me, this is not the most thing, and, yeah. and it's it's just a lesson for the next generation because that's what the next generation wants. Is their number one uh, goal is to be famous. That's like the number one thing that right. uh, you know the the emerging generation wants. So yes. um, I know I have a lot of. Uh, uh, people follow me on social media, mm. but funny I don't care much about it. And and but I I am very intentional in my social media. I'm very intentional in the way I interact with people and what I post. 
So that's something that I, I am very much aware of. Um, that I don't post a lot. Actually, I'm not. I'm not a very. Uh, I don't plan my very well, mm. but um, but I'm very intentional about it. That, mm. that doesn't uh, inspire or influence or encourage. I don't think I will post anything. So yeah. Interesting. Well, listen, I want to thank you for your time that you've given me today. And uh, just say again that you're one of my favorite people uh, uh, in the world uh, and certainly in the church world. And I think you are a genius. I think you are a creative genius and you are a joy to be around as a person, which is not always true of creative geniuses, but you are both of those things. And I appreciate that about you. You're a beautiful family. And I love your church to bits. And of course, Jeffrey and the team there, you guys are legends. Can't wait to spend some time with you again. I was due to be with you in June, of course, but we'll have to reschedule all that, I hope, for some time, maybe next year. Thank you for taking the time to listen to Paul Scanlon's podcast channel. We just wanted to remind you about the free course that's available to you on the five behaviors of successful people. So go and head over to paulscanlon.com forward slash free course to sign up for that today. And please do subscribe, share and review this podcast channel.